Thank you uh, for um, uh, for the floor. We are going to have this uh, session on the private sector initiatives against corruption. This is a very important topic um, because, uh, of course, it is uh, mentioned in the UN Convention Against Corruption. Uh, we have Article 12, as I said before, um, whereby state parties are requested to introduce uh, a measure to prevent corruption in the uh, private sector, including uh, requesting companies to have prevention of corruption strategies, customer uh, uh, due diligence, uh, uh, um, ethics, uh, uh, integrity frameworks, and so on. Um, it's also important to know that the uh, legal framework uh, uh, in the countries of the region is evolving. We heard yesterday from uh, um, Aliza and ACC about the introduction of the liability of legal persons uh, for corruption within the uh, um, uh, organic act, uh, which is obviously a major uh, step forward. So companies are uh, um, can be held accountable for uh, for corruption. So even uh, uh, more uh, incentives for for companies to uh, to prevent. Uh, 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 corruption. So we will hear now from three uh, distinguished uh, uh, speakers. Uh, the first one is uh, 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 Chanunda uh, uh, Pong Polso. Uh, I apologize if uh, I do not uh, pronounce the uh, norm very well. It's a project lead uh, at the Thai private sector coalition against uh, uh, corruption. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to uh, Kun uh, Chanunda, please. Uh, thank you, Francesco. Uh, I'm not so sure that did you see my slide and my voice well? We can see your slide and we hear you well. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so nice to meet you all. My name is Chananda Pungposok. I'm a project lead from uh, Thai CAC. The full name is quite long, the Thai Private Sector Collective Action Against Corruption. So I believe that uh, in this session, some of you might know about CAC and some not. So in my presentation, we'll will separate into three parts. First, about the CAC and about the effort of the Thai private sectors in fight with the corruption. Second is about the our initiative that try to drive change in the government uh, service. And the last one would be about the model uh, of the CAC that we think it would help to better engagement and help to reduce the, the corruption situation in Thailand. So sorry for the my camera. It's keep turn on and off is something wrong on the, the technical side. Okay. Okay, so when we talk about CAC, these pictures will tell you all about the story. Actually, we are the platform for the company, small and big company come together. So it's the initiative of private sectors uh, to tackle the corruption uh, through the collective actions. We believe that if all the company come together, uh, show the intention to fight the corruption, uh, have their uh, policy, have the mechanism in place uh, to not to be part of the corruption. So in the end, we can chase the corruption fish, which is the big fish away. So where's the CAC from? Uh, we are founded by the eight leading organizations such as uh, Thai Chamber of Commerce, Joint Foreign Chamber of Commerce, a Thai Listed Company Association, as we also have a Thai Institute of Directors as the secretary of the CAC. So today, uh, sorry. So today we have uh, like, um, thousand company that declared the intention uh, with the CAC. So we call this group as a signatory member. So they need to declare that the interest to join with CAC, they have intent to fight with corruption. And uh, we also have a second group of members with a certified member. We have uh, 472 companies that have a certification process with CAC, of which is uh, 26 is the SME. So what's the 
CAC did. Actually, we have like three missions. First, uh, for the gaining the critical mass is mean we're trying to collect the small fish come together, expand it larger and bigger to fight, uh, to chase away the corruption as the first slide that you saw. And second, we have an uplift compliance standard. What does it mean? In order to join with CAC to certify with CAC, we have a uh, visual of the checklist. Where's the checklist from? It's from the UK Transparency International, which has like a 260 uh, checklist. But for the Thai context and readiness of the Thai company, we drill down it to 31, uh, 71 checklists for the large corporate and also have a checklist for the SME, which has only 17 checklists. And uh, last year, we just launched or improved the new checklist of the set one checklist to include the uh, conflict of interest, uh, the revolving door facilitation payment and the process to reveal and controls the, the internal controls of the company as well. Besides of the checklist, we also have uh, provided knowledge to the company uh, about the uh, why they should join CAC, what the benefits for them in long term, and also a knowledge to certify or to uh, build the anti-corruption mechanism are in the company as well. And the last mission is about the co a solution. So we know that uh, just ourselves alone, we cannot change things much, but we need a partner. So we do uh, many uh, initiative projects with like uh, anti-corruption organization of Thailand or ACT, uh, UNDP, UNODC, and also be a uh, subcommittee with uh, NACC and PACC as well. So when we come to the certification or the checklist, you might wonder what the checklists are, are about, or the 71 or 17 checklist. Actually, it's all about in this picture. If we compare the corruption is a theft and uh, the building is the company, how to prevent the corruption access to the company? So in the checklist, it will uh, measure about seven topics. Uh, the first topic is about the risk assessment, and it's not just a risk of the operation, but it's about the corruption risks that the company need to understand. So first, they need to understand that corruption is corruption risk is different from fraud or, or accounting misappropriation. Uh, we need to look down at the company operation and observe that which department or which transaction that you need to deal with the uh, public sectors. So that's the risk might emerge. So once they understand the corruption risk and the assessment outright, so they can decide the control to mitigate to mitigate the risk. And the control have many kinds of control, right? Uh, operating control, uh, financial control, uh, control and romance in order to ensure that this control will help to reduce the risk of the corruption. From the control, the company should have the policy, the code of conduct and the procedures uh, that uh, allow their employees to follow. However, even you have all those things in place, but if you don't communicate to your employees, don't communicate to a board of directors or executive, it means not things. So another thing that we emphasize is communication internally and also uh, uh, the rules or regulations or policy that control not only the employees, but also cover the board of director and executive as well. So after you control, uh, you communicate internally, then you need to start communicate outside. This communication is mean that you communicate about the, the things you have, policy, procedure, controls, the intention that you have to the stakeholders, such as you are a supplier, a customer, or even the government agency that you associate or you need to contact with that. Okay, our company uh, fight for corruption, be a member of CAC, we cannot pay any facilitation payment. And the sixth topic is about the whistleblowing channel, how to build the effective whistleblowing channel that make everyone trust to report if they uh, found something uh, misappropriate. And the last one, of course, the continue monitoring the system because we don't uh, want the, the company just, you know, having uh, the text, the fairy tales, the, the luxury policy, but they don't do or they don't follow. So this monitoring will are uh, asking the compliance team at the company to review it regularly 
and also reassess the risks if the operation of the company change or sometimes they might uh, acquisition or expand the branch to other area. So of all this about the uh, 71 checklist. So when uh, the company declared the intention to join CAC, they have 18 months to uh, do this checklist as a self-assessment and improve their internal control, improve the system to comply with this checklist. And uh, from this part, uh, when they complete, they can send those reference documents uh, to the CAC. We have like three steps of reviewing. Uh, the first step is uh, reviewing by the uh, external auditor of the CAC. Uh, second step, if they can pass, they will go to the certification committee, which is the expert about the compliance uh, from the law firm, from the auditor firm. And if they pass this level, they will go up to the last one, which is a CAC council. So you can see that it's quite a lot of thought for the company to be a certified member of the CAC. So you might are uh, have a question that how the company can fill in this 71 checklist is their readiness to do it of course uh cac we also develop the anti-corruption courses which starts from a tone at the top or from the leaders of the company because we believe that in doing any things in doing the change it starts from the leader so we have a like ethical leadership program to let the leader understand uh, about the theory why tone from the top is important and also how to make it in practice even in the CAC as well so the leader will learn that how to build a culture is important and if I want to apply or improve my culture, what I should do next. Once the leader understands that role, uh, the company should have the system that complying uh, the, about the uh, anti-corruption compliance so they can build the system in the proper way. So we have like two courses, which is anti-corruption, the practical guide and corruption risk and control workshop to make them ready and understand the principle of building the corruption, anti-corruption uh, system. And lately we observed that many uh, government agencies sent the officers to learn on the anti-corruption, the practical guide and corruption risk and control. We also interviewed them why they interest on, on this course. And they said, uh, they interest on the principle, even the example is in the business side, but the principle is fact, so they can apply it and at the same time they can listen and they can hear the voice from the private sector directly, which is quite interesting information that can help them to improve uh, the area of working. And the last one is about the monitoring course. Of course, as I said, we don't want the company just send out this, the paper, but want them to ensure that uh, all the things really be in practice and in the right way. So this is the course that are teaching the company how to do the working papers for checking on the checklist, uh, on the 31 checklist. So the executive, the board of directors, everyone can ensure that everything that they had uh, is really in practice, is really in good place. So once they pass, as I said, uh, the, the reviewing process, they will got the CAC certification, uh, uh, as you can see the badge, and they will put the badge in the website, in the letters, in the business card to present that, okay, today our company is transparent, we don't want to deal with any corruption, and at the same time to recognize the effort. Uh, we also arranged the CAC award event and CAC conference uh, each year, but uh, so sorry that with the COVID situation, we need to skip for one year now. I'm not so sure when we can arrange it in offline. Uh, however, this is uh, the event that uh, helped the organization see that, hey, I'm not alone. I have a colleagues, I have a friend, I have a coalition that go on this way, go this journey with me. So there's very supportive community. And besides the CAC certification, we just launched the new program called the CAC Chain Agent. 
what does it mean? It means that the big corporate like the IRPC, uh, Bangja Corporation, CPN, uh, PTT, or even now we got Seven uh, Eleven as part of our chain agent. So those chain agent they have a lot of suppliers, which is SME. So if those chain agent trying to persuade the SME, the suppliers to join the CAC, it means it strengthen the transparency of their supply chain. That's uh, the things that the big corporate. Uh, start to concern more because if the supply chain are uh, got affect or have any rumor about the corruption, it might affect the corporate image as well. So for the, the company that want to get this award, they need to persuade uh, the suppliers to join CAC or declare intention to join CAC at least 10 companies a year. So you might think that Okay, we have a checklist, we have certification process. What's really practice uh, that the, the company did? So I have like a short story of our member. Uh, this uh, steel company. And before they they joined the CAC, they have like uh, the car, the, the truck that parking along the road, waiting to enter to the factory. Of course, when they park in the prohibited area, there is an officer that come to visit them and the truck driver need to pay some bribe. Uh, when the, the leaders of the company uh, saw this is a risk of corruption, how should we deal with it? This is the first intention. So actually they do many uh, process to improve, but uh, at the time, as a limited of time. So it goes to at the end of the result, they develop the applications, the, the mobile application or even SME to communicate with the uh, truck drivers at what time they should go into the factory. And if it's not time yet, you should park anywhere like gas station to wait. So no need to pay the bribe. And the company go beyond than that. They also check, uh, do a health check of the driver as well, uh, whether the uh, blood pressure is ready, uh, the alcohol level in the blood is okay. And they, they also do, sorry, checking the, the truck engine as well. Is it overload or is it in the uh, level of their okay that comply with the law? And from this one, it's mean that they're trying to do things that comply with the law and make it proper. So once the driver go out to the road, it's mean that even they go to, to meet the, some checkpoint of the police, uh, they already do the right thing. So no need for the driver to pay any bribe. And the uh, driver also got communication for the company that they have policy not to pay any bribe. So if there's a case that, you know, the, the officer might accuse something and ask for the bribe, they should insist that not to pay. So uh, next is about the initiative that we did. So I just are, uh, have only two examples that we did. Uh, first about the citizen feedback project um, is the initiative that we did with the uh, ACT HANS TMRS. Um, okay, so for this one is uh, what it's about. It's about uh, we get got the feedback uh, from the citizens when they asking for the uh, government service. Uh, and we asked them to uh, scan the QR code and give us a feedback, which uh, in the questionnaire or in the survey, we ask them directly, okay, did you offer the bribe? Uh, do you pay the bribe? So we can collect those uh, information as statistic. And this is our short story as a video. Today I'm ready to go to the government office to receive some service. And she walked past the people who were soliciting bribes to get the service done. But she waited for her turn. And finally, she was at the service counter. Her application was not approved, even though she had all the necessary documents. And she decided to file a complaint.
but because he was being monitored, so she decided to call on the hotline, but she was being asked too many personal questions, personal information. So she is wondering if there are any other ways to report the problem. And she found a QR code for this app because this app was developed based on the data that most people who wanted the reporting to be received and processed by private sector rather than the government. And this can help promote efficiency and competition among the government services, ensure convenience, good services without any bribery involved. That's basically the idea of the app. From this project, uh, we got many interesting uh, statistics like two of third, two of three, um, the citizen offer the bribe to officer without the officer asking. And uh, why they do that? Because they want to ensure that their request will be on time and not delay like a day. Uh, they think that if they don't play, they don't pay for the bribe, uh, it might take a day to get uh, to complete the service or complete this request. So I just offered it first. So that's really like our, uh, the problem in many aspects. And this information can help us to, you know, continue to do other uh, initiatives to help change the perception and at the same time to improve the service of the government as well. So going through the next one, uh, I show you about the CPI score, which I think you almost already know that Thailand still ranking in the another high place. Uh, our score is lower down, and we compare if uh, in the same ranking in two thousand twenty, we find that Thailand is the same level as Kosovo, Algeria, Albania, which I quite wonder because actually, uh, we pay a lot of you know budget on improving about the corrupt and uh, anti-corruption and uh, a lot of effort why why our scores still be here sometimes these informations reflect that the activity that we did the program that we do might not uh, do it properly or might not do it in the right place so it's going to the next initiative that we did with UN or uh, UNDP Thailand. It's about study uh, to understand the pain point of the company when they're dealing with the government agencies or when they're asking for the government service. So uh, this information we do like a survey uh, with, uh, with the private sector and asking them that, hey, which service that have a high risk of corruption, which service that you have uh, experience on bribery. And we got like the feedback uh, that we can separate like three tiers and each three, each tiers have like three agency on um, which we can prioritize or which one that we can uh, uh, asking for engagement for better improvement on the service. So once the, we got the survey result, we go down to interview with the company to understand the root cause, to understand that, hey, because of the private say they do something wrong, so they need to bribe, or because uh, they're trying to do things right, but they're afraid of something. They're afraid of the request not follow on time. They're afraid of retaliation if they don't pay. So all that information will collect and send to the, the expert in international level. And we're asking them to, uh, recommend do a recommendation report but in the broader view um, from this report we use the information to engage with the government agency but sorry that i cannot disclose all the information now because the final report uh, was not uh, published yet it's aimed to publish at the end of this month with the video so Please stay tuned. You can follow uh, CAC activities and also this report on the CAC website and on the Facebook page of Thai CAC. So uh, for the last slide, that uh, CAC model, we think that in order to have better engagement with the, the government to improve about the transparency, improve about the service level, are the private sectors, uh, should come together on the platform of the CAC. So at least ensures that they follow the rules. 
and they have the mechanism to to make them transparency to have them to make them good governance and at the same time the citizen can join the initiative of the act so it become to work together with the NACC and PACC. At the same time, if uh, the whistleblowing channel that the private sector or the citizen can give directly to, to like one center that um, they trust. As you see from the citizen feedback, there is a problem about the trust in giving the information. At the same time, in our project with UNDP, we also got the feedback that people or the private sector don't trust whistleblowing system of the government agency because they're afraid of retaliation. So in order to get those information, which is very important, but I want to share the real part that it should not just give information to, to execute someone, but it should be the information to prevent corruption. So if there is some signs or some signal that, hey, many private sector complain on the service, complain on the trans transparency of this service, of this province, what we should do, should we send the letters to, to let them know that, hey, someone monitor you now. So that's help to prevent, not just, you know, uh, investigate. And from uh, that, that information, uh, we can send a feedback, uh, and ACC, PAC can send the feedback directly to the public agencies, and that will help to let them improve uh, that process, that transparency, improve the support to the private sector and to the citizen. So that's all from the CAC. And if uh, you want to contact CAC, you can uh, check our information at the website or send email directly to me. Uh, we are more than welcome to discuss with the government agencies. If you want to know about the risks uh, of corruption that the private sector access, uh, is it related to your uh, organization or not? We can share those information to, with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Kun, uh, Kun Chanuna for, for the presentation. Uh, really interesting. Uh, um, I would say, you know, you described very well the, the compliance and, uh, and uh, prevention of corruption requirements for the private sector. And also uh, congratulations for the, uh, um, the initiatives of the coalition against uh, uh, corruption that reach out, I know, to a large number of companies uh, in Thailand, very important ones as well, like, you know, PPT or, or um, 7-Eleven, as you mentioned. So that's, that's really, I would say, uh, a very impactful uh, um, uh, initiative. So congratulations for that. Um, also, we look forward to, to seeing the results of the, of the study you mentioned. I think it's going to be uh, extremely, extremely interesting. Now, uh, we will have some Q&A, hopefully after the session, I would like to give the floor to our next speakers, which is uh, uh, a very uh, uh, interesting expert, Mr. John Frangos, who's a partner and deputy director uh, at Dispute Resol Resolutions at uh, Tilleke at Gibbings, which is uh, a private uh, firm, a, a law firm. Uh, hello, John, nice to see you. Uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, so now the floor is uh, uh, yours. Thank you, Francesco. And nice to see you too. And hello, everyone. Um, bear with me. I'm just going to share my screen for the slides today. Okay. So um, my name is John Frangos. I'm a law. I'm a partner at the law firm of Taliki and Gibbons here in Bangkok. Um, and it's very good to be with you all today. Um, I'll be speaking about anti-corruption compliance programs. So I lead our firm's regional compliance and investigations practice. And um, what we do primarily is advise clients and companies on preventing and investigating instances of corruption in Thailand and throughout Southeast Asia. Our clients really have many reasons why they wanna prevent instances of corruption and many of which I'll discuss today. But two key reasons um, is that our clients want to be in compliance with the law and because of their reputations. Um, and I think we've heard about that somewhat during this uh, seminar and I'll go into the, some of those de into detail about what companies are doing what our clients do 
to ensure that they don't engage in corruption or that their employees or third parties engage in, in corruption. And really the answer to that is anti-corruption compliance programs. But first, let me just give a broad statement about corruption in the private sector. So for corruption and bribery, it's really a multi-party affair. Um, you need at least two people to have bribery. You need someone to give a bribe and then someone to receive the bribe. And the giver of the bribe is often private business um, or at least someone who's working on behalf of a private business. Bribes are given by business for um, primarily financial gain. It could be to win a contract, earn a commission, or um, just seek some sort of favorable treatment. So just from a general policy perspective, the idea is if no one gives a bribe or offers to give a bribe, then you'll see corruption decrease. Um, and so this is known as the supply side, if you will, of, of bribery. Um, so how can the private sector lower its bribery risk? And the answer to that is an anti-corruption compliance program. And the purpose of an anti-corruption compliance program is to ensure that um, a company or an organization complies with uh, the law, various rules and regulations, and generally to uphold good conduct in its own corporate reputation, which you may recall is one of the key um, reasons why companies don't want to engage in, in corruption. And you can think of a compliance program as really an internal corporate function, like a department or a, um, a group within an organization whose job it is to make sure that that organization and the people that the organization does business with do not engage in bribery. So why should a company have an anti-corruption compliance program? You know, many companies might look at it as a cost, as something which um, doesn't make any money for the organization. Well, there's a number of good reasons for it. Well, first and foremost is that it's morally correct for a company not to engage in corruption. It's good for society. So in that sense, a company having an anti-corruption compliance program can be viewed as being something which is morally correct. Um, the law might require it. As we'll see towards the end of my presentation, as I'm sure many of you know and have seen already, there's strong incentives under Thai law for a company to have an anti-corruption compliance program. And that applies also under different laws like the UK Bribery Act, which um, criminalizes bribery from UK companies abroad, and the United States Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which is very wide reaching and allows the US government to prosecute companies outside the United States that are subject to that law for bribery. The FCPA doesn't have a specific anti-corruption compliance requirement within the statute, but it's broadly understood and, and in various guidelines that a company can mitigate its liability if it has a compliance program. Also, corporate codes of conduct may require an anti-corruption compliance program. Many companies will have their own internal conduct codes that might say, we have this anti-corruption compliance program and everyone has to follow it. And then what's more, if a company does engage in corruption, that's a violation of law. It's a violation usually of criminal law. And there can be very serious consequences. Um, for one, when a company does understand that its, um, its staff or its business partners may be involved in corruption, it has to investigate that, it has to find out what happened. And depending on the case, that could take a lot of time and a lot of money. Just to give you an example, the American company Walmart, um, I understand, spent over 1 billion US dollars in legal fees investigating corruption allegations. And then a company has to take measures to remediate and fix the problems. And again, that takes time, it takes resources. A law enforcement authority 
can issue fines against a company, which can be very high in the United States, for example, and, and in Europe, um, and not just against a company, but against individuals involved. And what's more, as we've mentioned, corruption and bribery is generally a crime. So that could lead potentially to prison time to people who are involved. It could also lead to debarment where companies are debarred from engaging in government contracts or World Bank contracts and um, follow on civil litigation. This is an issue more so in the United States than I've seen in Thailand, but it could potentially start here where you have shareholders of companies suing the company saying that by you engaging in bribery, you have affected the share price. And now we're going to uh, file a suit against you, a civil lawsuit. And then last but not least, a company that engages in corruption can have serious um, reputational damage because that company can be known to be doing business dishonestly and just generally not in the best interest of society. And that loss of reputation can certainly affect a loss of business. Now, another factor is employee discipline. And what I mean by this is that if a company has bribery or it's um, the company's engaging in bribery, employees might see that and see, well, this organization commits illegal acts. This organization commits crimes. Therefore, perhaps I can get away with committing crimes such as embezzlement or fraud and not take the company seriously since the organization is um, engaging in wrongdoing. So what makes an effective anti-corruption compliance program? And I think the critical issue to understand is that there really isn't one program that fits every company, no one size fits all program. Every company will have a different compliance pro program that will have to be tailored to fit that organization. Um, the other critical component is that a compliance program should not be considered as a check the box exercise. And what I mean by that is a compliance program has to be real, has to be implemented and actually functioning, not just something which exists on paper, where if a company has, let's say, a, a document with a series of boxes and says, okay, do we conduct our training? Okay, let's check that box. Did we do our risk assessment? Let's check that box. These things have to be real. Um, and I mentioned this before that the compliance program has to be tailored because every organization is different. Um, for example, an oil and gas company will have different anti-corruption um, needs, challenges, and say an accounting company. So the compliance program has to be changed in accordance with the type of organization. So now I'm going to talk about some of the key elements of an anti-corruption compliance program. Um, and we've heard this mentioned before, tone at the top is absolutely critical. And um, that's why it's the first in this list here, because the leadership will set the tone for the rest of the organization. If the leadership takes a very strong position against corruption, then that will set the culture throughout. Um, and then this is known as being the mood in the middle, like the middle management, they understand um, the culture as well as what's going on amongst the bottom of the pyramid, amongst all the staff. A good compliance program will also have a very clear and easy to understand code of conduct and set of policies and procedures. These are written documents written in a very concise way that all employees can understand and have access to where the policies, the code of conduct, they're not just within a company's intranet they're behind a locked uh, drawer. Every employee can access these things. And that they're, uh, for example, well, what we always advise our clients, our American clients or foreign clients, that they have to be translated into Thai or um, whatever the local language is in the country that we're working in. Um, so all employees can understand. These policies and procedures have to be 
um, reviewed and updated because situations changed. The policies and procedures from 10 years ago may not apply now. And um, the types of policy and procedures will vary by the business. So you can't take one company's policies and procedures and then apply them to a different company because those companies will be um, very different. And again, you'll hear me use this example throughout my talk. An oil and gas firm will likely have different policies and procedures from say a food manufacturing company or an accounting firm. Another critical factor is that every compliance program has to be adequately funded, have appropriate oversight and autonomy. That is a degree of independence where that compliance function is not um, necessarily um, directly under a CEO who can tell it what to do and be influenced by it. It has to have a degree of autonomy. As you'll see here, there's many functions within the compliance group. Um, there's training, there's the policies, due diligence on, on third parties to make sure that those third parties aren't engaging in corruption. So all of these functions require adequate staffing and adequate resourcing um, in order for them to be appropriately managed and for it to work. A core component as well of any compliance program is the risk assessment. Um, risk assessments, I know in the US under the, uh, the United States Department of Justice guidelines on compliance program, risk assessments are one of the most important factors because of, or components rather of compliance program because a risk assessment will tell the company what it should do to prepare for the risks. It will tell the company what risks are out there. Um, the type of risk factors will inclu include the country. You know, for example, what we tell our clients, the risk factors might be different for corruption, might be different in say Myanmar compared to Vietnam, compared to Thailand or Laos, Cambodia. Um, the type of industry will affect the risks, how much of um, how much is that company doing business with government officials that will affect the risks? And um, yeah, you'll see here, there's many different factors. And so a company has to really take the time and the um, expense to conduct a proper risk assessment. And that risk assessment will then frame, in many cases, the rest of the compliance program. Now, training is also um, an integral part of a compliance program because a company might have the best policies and procedures, but if the company does not train its employees or other third parties about its position within anti-corruption and its uh, policies and procedures, then it won't be as effective. Um, and that training also has to be tailored because the training a CEO or senior management might receive will be different than say, the sales team, because they'll face different risks on a day-to-day -day basis. The sales team might be um, on a day-to-day -day basis dealing with government officials, trying to win contracts, whereas management's making decisions. So training has to reflect that. What's also important is that the company have um, a guidance mechanism where if staff have question about how the policy is implemented and what they should do in a practical sense, they could seek guidance. They're not just left on their own. An example would be, let's say you have uh, a company has a sales team and they're, they're wondering, can we take this official out to lunch? Will that be an, a, vi a violation of our anti-corruption compliance policy? The sales team should be able to access the, the company's guidance program or receive advice. What's also very important is that the company frame its compliance program within its overall HR function. And what that means is that if employees comply and follow the program, they should be rewarded. And on the flip side, if employees do not comply with the compliance program, they have to be disciplined because generally speaking, an organization gets 
the behavior it rewards. So if a company wants its employees and all of its management not to engage in corruption, it has to reward compliance within its own anti-corruption compliance program. And the idea also was that this would have a deterrent effect because if employees know that they'll be punished, if they breach the compliance program, then chances are they won't um, engage in that kind of behavior. Pardon. Okay, so um, confidential reporting and internal investigation. What this really means is whistleblowing. And so a company should have its own internal whistleblower mechanism where employees will feel confident that they can report suspected or actual wrongdoing confidentially and without fear of retaliation, like they won't get fired if they do um, report wrongdoing. And then a company will be able to quickly and efficiently investigate the allegation and then document the response and using the formal report and then take disciplinary action. Because um, if a company doesn't have this, senior management may not even know what's going on. They may not even know that there are um, uh, instances of corruption going on. The compliance program also has to be continuously approved. And this means um, regular testing and review, because as we mentioned earlier, the risks and the compliance environment will change over time. The laws will change. Um, the type of customers a company will be working with will change. For example, 20 years ago, a company may have very few government customers, but then now it has many. And so the compliance program has to be um, updated in accordance with that. And the testing will also expose any weaknesses in the program. So um, this is a critical factor as well. So I'm sure most of you here are familiar with this um, element of the Thai anti-corruption law, but you'll see in the Organic Act on Counter-Corruption that, that a compliance program is um, is very much rewarded in the sense that a company can mitigate its risk if it has a program. So um, this is very strongly encouraged for any company that wants to ensure that it does not engage in corruption. So that's my presentation and I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, very comprehensive overview of compliance uh, uh, and prevention of corruption programs uh, uh, for the private sector. So um, um, excellent to hear this and uh, also, you know, on the incentives for companies to uh, um, introduce this type of compliance programs, very important to, to, to promote this. Um, now we are going to have Q&A later on. Hopefully, uh, please, uh, um, your colleagues, prepare your questions if you have. Uh, and now we're going to go to our uh, last speaker for the session, which is uh, Kun Prayong Iruyang Wanich. Uh, sorry again if I didn't pronounce the name well. Member of the Executive Committee of the uh, ACT which is the Organization for Anti-Corruption of uh, Thailand. So, Kun uh, um, the floor is yours. Good, good morning and good afternoon, uh, all the participants. I'll be briefly talking about the Anti-Corruption Organization of Thailand, or ACT, which is a NGO and private sector organization established by the Thai Chamber of Commerce, Federation of Thai Industries and the Thai Bankers Association in 2011. And at the moment we have 54 uh, partners or alliances, uh, including the NACC, uh, ACC, NACC, and 
and we are funded by the Anti-Corruption Organization of Thailand Foundation, which receives the donation from private sectors. We are run by volunteer retired business persons and retired government officials uh, pro bono on a pro bono basis. And we aim to be a driving force to encourage Thai citizens in all sectors to fight corruption with zero tolerance. We, our uh, mandate is not in suppression because we don't have the such power as a private sector organization, but we work in the area of whistleblowing uh, or as the watchdog. And we also work in terms of inculcation of values for the new generation of Thai citizens to have the uh, proper idea against corruption in the government uh, sector, as opposed to the past where such practices were accepted and we also work in terms of prevention, which will I will be talking more in depth later. During the past 10 years since our establishment, uh, we have worked with the National Reform Committee in in drafting in the drafting of the constitution of 2017 which is known as the anti corruption constitution which as it also uh, established the corruption court and it was and also extended the statute of limitation for corrupt fugitives uh, to be brought to justice. And we also, the, it also has a provision to punish private sectors involved in corruption. And also the including, uh, work also included in the, the, the amendment of the Procurement Act and the use of IP and cost program. So these are the two tools that are deployed under the Procurement Act. As for the Integrity Pact or IP, which is uh, the global norm, uh, normally there are two sides to a contract, which is the public procuring organization and the private sector. But we the IP introduced it, an independent third party to the public procurement process. And there will be uh, the involved party will co sign the integrity pact. And there is a check and balance system that is installed. And uh, the Anti-Corruption Cooperation Committee chaired, chaired by the Permanent Secretary of the Finance Ministry will choose the IP project and the act is assigned to recruit independent observers to uh, any particular project. And the IP criteria is for projects uh, above uh, 1 billion baht, and this is used to observe all of the steps and processes. And if there are any regularity, irregularities observed, we can report uh, through the notification report. And if it's not addressed, then we can report to the NACC. 
And the benefits to the government is cost savings and more efficient use of government budget for uh, quality services and infrastructures without delay, without delay. And uh, with those benefits are fair competition and the elimination of uh, bribery cost and the increase of uh, new bidders into the system. And the people will also get better infrastructure. And in IP or integrity pact have been implemented in 129 procurement projects with a total budget of 1.3 trillion baht of which 73 projects were already awarded or completed so and with a saving of 104 billion baht or 26 percent below the budget and and we have also applied uh, this integrity pact with the PPP project or a private public partnership project. And we, the original contract was proposed at uh, 260 billion baht, but with the rounds of questions from the IO team, the budget was reduced by 14 percent or 37 billion baht so, and also the government also received additional profit sharing of 52 billion million baht over the project life. So PPP is another focus area of the government where the integrity pact have been employed. And this would not have been possible without the support of the prime minister and the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Transport. And in addition to the monitoring uh, savings and returns, there are other impacts which are non-financial, but I would like to focus on number eight. This, as a result of the integrity pact, we, the project team involved, consisting of uh, in, uh, public officials with integrity, will be protected from the ill influence or the pressure to co collaborate with the corruption scheme. And ultimately, the IP will help build a transparent culture of all public procurement to ensure maximum public interest. The other tool is the infrastructure transparency initiative or cost. I will not uh, go much into detail about this because I understand that another speaker will delve into dive into details on cost in the afternoon. 
And in Thailand, we use cost as the complementary tool to integrity pact. Basically, cost is aimed to maximize the value of money in public infrastructures. The difference between cost and IP is that IP is a project that is uh, being implemented by the government and IP will help ensure transparency. But for cost, the citizens can also participate in this uh, procedure and cost is, consists of four components. The first is MSG, which is the stakeholders, and other components are disclosure and assurance. So these are the three components which help empower citizens in the monitoring and of these projects. For MSG Thailand, we have 17 members uh, in the committee chaired by the director general of the CGD and 10 members from government organizations, three from private sector and four from civil societies. Uh, ideally it should be one third, one third, one third, but in Thailand, we have a slightly different composition to the committee. And under cost, the public procurement agencies must disclose 40 proactive data points and 26 reactive data points of the project on Cost Thailand website. And the assurance team will analyze these data points and report to the MSG for needed action. Cost is applied to projects under 1,000 million baht in value, and which is uh, uh, suitable or appropriate for projects undertaken by the local administration administrative organizations to ensure that uh, to ensure public participation in monitoring of the project. As of today, there are almost 1,400 projects in cost program with a total budget of 250 billion baht, out of which uh, 858 projects can, have been awarded. And we have saved uh, 17, almost 18 billion baht or 15.6% out of the awarded projects. These are the cost projects are small scale and 85% are the local government projects. The area of improvements for cost program in Thailand are the delayed in the disclosure and also in the completion of the disclosure and the feasibility of the project and stakeholders approval by local administrations are still missing in the most part as opposed to the uh, big infrastructure project by the central government. So public participation in cost program will help uh, cut down this number of unnecessary or improper uh, projects. And also the number of bidders are still low. There's still a lot of uh, uh, monopoly or uh, 
dominant players who dominate uh, the bidding project and there's the willingness of, to apply cost there is still uh, resistance but a good example is Chacheng South Province with which is a large province with uh, big budgets for the local governments and we receive support from the provincial governors to request our local governments in Chacheng South to uh, apply costs to all of their projects. So if this is successful, we can expand or scale up this uh, idea to the whole country. And X also have developed an app called Build Better Lives that will also complement the data published by the Comptroller General Department. And you can look up data from across the country, including those within uh, 50 or 100 kilometers ladies from your location. And you can also look it up by category, whether they are road projects or other infrastructure projects, and you can participate in reporting whether the implementation is um, in accordance with the contract. So you can look us up by using this QR code. So IP and cost are complementary, but I would say that IP is a quick win because we have independent observers who are in constant monitoring of the process and the result are huge cost saving. As I said earlier, we have saved more than 100 billion baht out of uh, in integrity pact. But for cost uh, relies more on uh, declaration and disclosure, but cost also allows public participation and also acknowledge uh, public petition and complaints. So there are certain projects, uh, experimental projects where we run both IP and cost, including for one airport project, one expressway and two intercity highways. And we found that the application of both uh, beneficial and can save uh, costs as well as to address uh, public complaints. Therefore, the two intercity highway were completed before the due date and without any uh, complaint from the neighboring communities. So in conclusion, fighting corruption is not an option, but a must and cannot delegate, cannot be delegated to any single party. So every citizen must collectively fight against corruption together actively. So if there, are, if there is uh, 10, you know, 10 minutes for us to exchange, that would be great for, for our discussion based on the presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very, very good presentation also. Uh, also, thank you for for Kun Prayong for, for uh, uh, highlighting how the civil society can uh, uh, really contribute to preventing corruption, in particular in public procurements and these uh, examples you mentioned, cost, uh, and integrity programs are really well known uh, to us and to our sister agency, UNDP, uh, and they are known to be effective uh, uh, tools. So, so uh, also thank you for, for, for your effort in, in, in promoting this, these initiatives. 
Um, now, um, we are a bit late, but I would like to take if there's any uh, question or comment from the participants. Uh, uh, anybody would like to say a few words? Uh, maybe we take a few minutes and then we will postpone a little bit the lunch. So, um, anyone who, who, who would like to take the floor? I think everybody is hungry. <laughs> Maybe, but let's give them a few seconds to think. So, uh, good afternoon. I have a question to Kun Prayong. So, in your project, actually, like I try to keep it short because many people are looking forward to the lunch. So, in your project um, for act and for cost, we uh, focus on uh, project administration and try to prevent the corruption in the public procurement project. However, this found that um, corruption has its own evolution so apart from like procurement they don't rely on the budget but we can see the um, policy corruption in order to have like enable um the um monopolization or um semi-monopolization um, um it does not actually like involve the budget but it involves changing of the regulation or policy and push the card for the grassroots root population or normal citizen and then they overrule the standard of um, products or service how can act um, intend to implement um, policy related corruption thank you so much for your question i think like the ip at best we would like to participate before drafting the tor so we try to participate and send our observer during the TOR preparation. They have um, our observer, uh, the retired um, government officer or the um, business sector, ex former executive. So they can participate in the drafting of the TORs. And they can just like um, reveal the TOR, whether this is for the benefit of the public or the government. Sometimes the, the way they draft the TOR is like over spec. It's just like one um, supplier who can supply high, excessively high quality product or service, which can only be supplied by that supply, uh, a certain suppliers. We also check about um, the um, approval of the procurement process. We will check about the um, reporting or um reporting process or even like the grievance mechanism for the um the bidder so this will prevent the government from procuring excessively um expensive unnecessary expensive product or service if you have only two um bidder then we will just like um try to pinpoint or red flag this um, procurement project. I think my question actually like involved the policy uh, related corruption. Is this not about the bidding process? This is not about kind of like bidding corruption, but it involved setting up a private sectors organization and operate in the business in competition with other business operator or other corporate. But um, the regulation or the requirement will be um, manipulated in order to enable the nepotism to, um, to forage. And this will push the cost on the um, citizen or like the taxpayer, this is not about the bidding process. I think like we try to 
ensure that we can have the policy oversight. Even though we cannot control the policy itself, we can actually like red flag or like question the process. If you monitor the meals, I think, I, I think like uh, we talk about the northern, uh, the northeastern um, dual rail track and um, construction. So in the north, there are like three contracts. In the northeast, there are like um, two contracts. There are five bidders. So every bidder actually like won their portion of the contracts. So is, is that uh, a coincidence? Coincident, I think this is different than the NPCO. So the Southern Railroad, you, um, there are like many smaller contracts. So there are a lot of um, competitors and this open an opportunity for small scale um, construction um, service providers. I think this is um, the case for like um, policy bets uh, relate, related corruption. So when the policy is drafted that way in the agreement, you cannot do um, anything we just want to monitor that there are no corruption in the bidding process this is can be a, a so, so solution um collusion um between the different um, um competitor or bidder and that can be one of the process that we can monitor the dubious project ensure that there's no like collusion among the competitors so i have just like um short question i think like you are hungry you guys are hungry now and everybody is ready for lunch. Um, I have like short question. I think I am a lecturer at Mahajula Longkorn um, University. I think there are many organizations um, in the Royal Irrigation Project or the um, security sectors um, construction projects. So one this project has uh, the winner. Uh, for that um, government procurement project, the uh, the um, government, let's say like the security sector actually like use their own machinery to um, to in that construction project. So the private sector bid for that project and that private sector um, bid the, you know, like use um, government machinery to in that construction. I think I understand what you mean. <laughs> I understand what you mean, and I think like if um that um project engage or like um is the partner of the IP project, we have um this IP project. We we have about two hundred observer. That is not a lot, but most of them as um senior citizen. Those people who are older than like um sixty years old, like um from like over 60 to up to like some person is almost like 80 years old. And we use this expert to actually like monitor this project. We still need people to actually like help being our observer, our volunteer work on pro bono basis. And we, um, they work on pro bono basis, they are not paid. And the Department of Comptroller General have said that they are going to pay the honorarium um, 5,000 baht per month. That is for the transportation and committing for our expert. And they cannot be high or they cannot be employed. Some people decided to, you know, like relinquish their um, trans, uh, transportation or like a meeting honorarium. We need a lot of volunteer for this process. Some volunteer decided to um, donate their honorarium to act. And if you don't have any conflict of interest with the business sector, after you retire, you can join our observer or our pool of expert project. We actually, apart from the human resources, um, we used to get um, the budget from the government about 36 million baht uh, for training fees and training expenditures. Um, we um, provide training for our observer and we also um, provide um, general training and the budget has been cut to only 12 million baht this year. So we don't have uh, sufficient resources for project and if we want I always say that we can save a lot of um, public or taxpayer money, like um, tens, over 10 billion baht, a couple of um, 10 billion baht. Many people would just say that, okay, X can do like 100 um, project for, for free or like pro bono um, basis. I kind of like want to um, operate with the local administration organization 
and because like it can save the taxpayer money and many people appreciate at um, our um, 200 expert work on pro bono basing they have been working hard so we need our um, other stakeholder and our network member to kind of like help contributing to our activities because we do not have um, enough resources okay thank you very much uh for the uh discussion uh, uh, um very very interesting and 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 uh really to hear about uh, how this this project work and um, you know the cooperation of course with the government authorities for preventing corruption in public procurement is also very important so i'm sure all our colleagues here will not um, I think we'll have to close here. I would like to really thank uh, again our uh, speakers, uh, Kun Chanunda, Mr. John, uh, and uh, Kun Prayong for their very comprehensive and interesting uh, uh, presentations. Uh, you will have their contacts if you would like to follow up with them also with some uh, specific questions.